Welcome to the Lentil Intervention Podcast, raising awareness and inspiring action for personal and planetary health with your hosts, Ben and Emma. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 34 for the year. My name is Ben Eidelberg. And I'm Emma Strutt. Now, we used to say that Emma's coming to you from Boona in Queensland, but Emma, that's no longer the case. Temporarily. So I've relocated for a couple of months. So I'm now in Blackwater, which is, you know, the mining capital of Queensland, which is interesting as a environmentalist plant-based eater. But yeah, no, it's, um, it's been good. So I'm on Gangaloo territory at the moment. Brilliant. So if any of our listeners are out there, uh, please reach out to Emma. I hear it's not as populated as where she came from. (laughs) So uh, any plant-based eateries or any amazing trail walks, let her know and I might pop around for a visit too once I'm out of lockdown. Now, before we get started, um, there's two acknowledgements we need to make because we don't do these enough. Firstly, there's been a lot of activity on our socials this past few weeks, LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram. So thank you so much for all the likes, the shares and even the private messages that we receive. To us, it's not necessarily a numbers game of how many followers we have, but how engaged you all are. So it's really nice to see, keep them coming in. Secondly, whilst I personally don't drink any coffee, thank you for the coffees you have been buying us. Every small donation makes a dent in our administrative costs, such as keeping this podcast reaching your own ears. We have a very open book policy with everything we do. So head on over to our website and you will find a breakdown of all our costs. That's it. Right. On to the business end, Emma. Uh, we've got some real, some of the real pioneers in the Australasian whole food plant-based movement. That's right. Yeah. So today we're very lucky because we're joined by a dynamic duo that I think a lot of our listeners will already be very familiar with, um, Jenny Cameron and her partner, Dr. Malcolm Mackay. Malcolm is an experienced GP and lifestyle medicine practitioner, and Jenny is a nutritionist and research librarian and together they are the force behind Plant-Based Health Australia. They also make up part of the team at the newly launched Melbourne Lifestyle Medicine, which I'm very keen to find out more about today. So Jenny, Malcolm, thank you so much for joining us. Long overdue. Thank Thank you, you, Emma. Uh, It's an honor to be invited to uh, speak on your podcast. Yes, indeed. Now we have, and we, we seem to find a lot of power couples these days with our interviews. Um, so let's start off a little bit about your own personal background, uh, your own personal journey towards a whole food plant based way of living. Um, well, I guess my journey began, began a very long time ago. I was in medical school actually, and, and in a cardiology lecture, uh, I was rather grossed out as a 20 year old, horrified. The, the cardiology lecturer showed us all these. Uh, slides of you know heart attacked hearts and stroked out brains etc gangrenous legs and talked about the general process of artery disease all over the body atherosclerosis and he actually used the term the inevitable process of atherosclerosis and uh, for someone who was you know getting into a bit of distance running at age 20 and who, who was already thinking like they'd like to have a long healthy life this wasn't very good was bad news, although there were risk factors mentioned. Um, It was fortunate in the same semester, another lecturer actually told us about other groups of people in the world, particularly I remember the people of Highland Papua New Guinea, who never got this inevitable disease that killed most people in the Western world. Um, And that really got my interest. And so it was interesting because whenever other topics came up in our course whether it was breast cancer prostate cancer diabetes it was always the same factors over and over again you know the the western diet with far too much fat and salt and meat not enough fiber and not enough physical activity etc um so i I was in i I was in on this because um as i said i I was uh, beginning to compete a bit in distance running and um yeah, it seemed to work for me. I think within a year, I'd run a 232 marathon. I won one of the early triathlons before everyone got serious about triathlon. Um, and so that was really the start of my journey. Some years, a few years later, I discovered Nathan Pritikin and Nathan Pritikin and his work had a big influence on me. We used to hang out with the Pritikin converts, with the Pritikin Health Association in Adelaide. And already at that stage, I'd graduated. But I realised that my nutrition had big gaps in it. And so I actually went back to university uh, as an online or as a, be an Australia Post 
um, course back in those days and um, completed the eight subjects at uh, Deakin University to get a graduate diploma in human nutrition. Um, fast forward many years and more recent years, um, where I started from, the idea that I wanted to be fit and healthy and exercise was important and back in those days I was dabbling with a bit of meditation and, and stuff. Um, so when lifestyle medicine really became a thing, you know, the last decade, that really interested me, it sort of took me back a bit to where I started from, nutrition plus the whole lifestyle picture. And so in about 2018, I completed the, um, the uh, board certification in lifestyle medicine with ASLM. And in 2019, um, I was given a fellowship of the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine. I've talked too much. I shall hand over to Jenny Cameron. Well, my story is um, I worked as a librarian at a university for many years. And I actually, for um, in the year in which I met Malcolm, which was 2008, um, I was working with a, um, a faculty that actually taught nutrition. And so I, I thought I had at my fingertips all the knowledge I needed. And uh, so when I met Malcolm, so and I ate, you know, a standard Australian diet, I'd call it a good version of it. I always love veggies and, uh, you know, uh, but I, there was a lot I didn't know. And so when Malcolm introduced me to the concept of, um, you know, plant-based, whole food plant-based, it took me a long time to get my head around that. I could do vegetarian, like I'd, I'd sort of dabbled with that in my younger years. But in, in you know, going back 13 years ago, I was raising, I had two teenage children. And so I was doing all the things that, you know, we're, we're taught to do in terms of making sure I had enough meat for iron and, and you know, all the stuff for calcium and all of that. And uh, so when we first met, we lived interstate. Um, I lived in Melbourne, he lived in Adelaide. And so we, we had a committed relationship for some time. And I would eat the way he ate when we were together. And, uh, and then I'd go home and, uh, and, you know, ate the way I always had. But I slowly leaned in. I'd say in the first 12 months, I leaned into eating more plant foods um, and cutting out, you know, first the red meat and the chicken and, and the eggs. But I was very reluctant to give up dairy and uh, and also had this idea that surely fish is healthy. So I, I, my, I kept eating those until um, Malcolm introduced me to uh, the book, The China Study, and that really blew me away. And, uh, and from then I thought, why didn't I know this? I, I don't get why I hadn't heard any of this. It made so much sense. And so that, that set me on a on that on an absolute quest for knowledge and immersed myself in in, in everything I could, um, and eventually uh, jumped out of the library world and uh, retrained as a nutritionist. First, starting off with the e Cornell course, the certificate in plant based nutrition, um, but I, I then went back and and did a, a graduate certificate um, in nutrition at, at DK. So part of the course that Malcolm had done decades earlier. And uh, so that, that's kind of my story. I, I'm, I call myself one who slowly leaned in and learned more. And the more I learned, the more, you know, the more on board I became. And eventually in 20, February 2012, um, the long distance part of the relationship ended and I actually moved to Melbourne to live with Jenny and, and sort of... Uh, and be closer to Falls Creek. Yeah, yeah, that was handy. I mean, that was really handy. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I guess since that time, we've been on a bit of a whole foods plant-based uh, mission. And you both mentioned there that you um, kind of eased into this way of eating over a period of time. I know I did too when I first made that transition. But now that you've been in this space for so long and you've worked with so many different people, how do you recommend people make the transition now? Do you still recommend slow and steady or should some people kind of make that overnight switch? I think it de depends on where they are with their health and, and also on their personality type. You know, uh, if you see the, you know, the post movie footage from the Game Changers, um, you know, James Cameron, um, he just did the instant switch. Uh, I'm a bit of an all or none person. Fortunately, I don't drink alcohol. It's bad enough I drink tea. But I'm a bit of an all or none person. And so, you know, for me, it would be, although I did eat small amounts of fish, you know, over the years, but for me, I'd be a quick change over person. But uh, um, it, it, going back to the health, 
Yeah, like if you've got severe heart disease and you're facing up to having, you know, a bypass or stents and you'd rather take um, take a, a more treat the cause approach, then you might need to change over very quickly. Or if you've got severe, you know, rheumatoid arthritis and you really want to get on top of it, then there's not going to be, you're going to have to have a high adherence to get results. You know, a little bit of moderation in oil and too many fats and a few animal products could really be your undoing. But for, for people who are, you know, apparently healthy and younger and things, Jenny will explain to you that, that usually the, the common way to do this is, um, is a gradual transition. Mm, well, and to concentrate on adding in, um, to crowd the plate out with adding more whole plant foods, um, thinking about adding in some grains, adding in some beans and, uh, you know, eventually taking the animal foods off the plate. And uh, but one of the things that, that we're very um, sort of strong, you know, talk, talk vocally about is that it, it's as much it's importance to add in the whole foods as it is to remove the animal foods, that the real power of eating this way, the, the, the contributing to your health, um, it might be different in terms of planetary health, but in, in terms of your health is to be eating those whole grains, those beans, um, vegetables and fruit in a minimally processed form. And even for planetary health, I mean, the less processed it is, the less energy that's going into making the packaging, you know, anyway, that's a tangent for another day. Now, um, you know, we'll, we'll definitely go a little bit deeper into this because, Jenny, you know, you mentioned the approach needs to be, it's not an exclusion approach in terms of taking out and then it's like, gosh, there's nothing left on the plate. It's more about adding in and, and boosting mm -hmm. what you may already be consuming or maybe not. Um, and I can certainly relate to your journey because I think over 20 years ago, I became vegetarian and the dairy was a big component until, like all of us, and we say that we tell the story a lot now on our show, the China study, the first book you read, why the hell did I not know this? Why the hell does no one else know this? And then that change becomes a bit more, uh, I guess, immediate in terms of, okay, well, actually, <laughs> this is what's happening to me. But before we move on, Malcolm, I just want to touch on one component because I can also relate to that, your, your running, your triathlon. Um, I was going to say your triathlon days, but I don't know if you still compete. But when you first made the change, and you were still competing and, and doing your, your marathon running and so on. Were there any significant, I guess, lessons learned at the start? Because athletes are not your your average person in terms of the amount, amount of calories we're consuming, amount of oxidative stress on the body. So, you know, we need more certain nutrients, et cetera. Were there any sort of pitfalls you came across or lessons that you learned at the start that if you knew better, you might have avoided? Yes, I think so. And, and I think I did better at avoiding pitfalls um, when um, uh, I became single again in about 2006 uh, at the end of two, and um, I joined a local triathlon club in Adelaide and threw myself back into triathlon for a few years. Um, and now I'm not doing any cycling. I do some swimming with Jenny when we're allowed to swim here in Melbourne. Um, but I have, I do still compete in running events and um, I did some virtual half marathons last year and I ran the Gold Coast Marathon in July, my first marathon for a few years. That's the last virtual marathon I'm going to run for a long time. But being down to the, the crux of it, yeah, I, I think usually the problem is not eating enough mm. uh, or, you know, if, if you're eating, you know, um, meat and dairy and olive oil and, and um crap that's calorie rich and processed like vegan food then you know you could stuff in thousands of calories in the evening and you get away with it you won't be healthy but if you're eating things like oats brown rice potatoes beans and it's not a really fat rich diet it's a big volume of food and i think i always had it right from the start in you know eating a giant bowl of you know, oats and fruit and things for breakfast uh I, um and, and I throw some sultanas in there quite generously, like I figure I like the sweetness and I, I need the calories. Um, but I, I think I used to not eat enough through the day. And then I'd get to the evening and I'd be stuffing in rice and vegetables and my stomach would be over full. And be, like having an eating disorder, your body would still be saying, I need more calories. And your stomach would be saying, 
not one more after dinner mint please sir <laughs> modern um, so I, I think for an athlete I, i'd be saying you will need to eat a lot you will need to um you know spread that through the day a bit you'll need to pause for morning tea for lunch when i was like in my 20s i think i'd eat things like dried bananas all day and things for extra snacks but not probably not the healthiest approach to take. Actually, I did get on a bit of a banana thing where I used to eat it. I remember once went to the snow and I took a whole box of bananas with me for the week for the extra. But um, yeah, so my advice would be to sort of plan ahead for some morning tea, for some lunch, for some afternoon tea, you know, sort of push those calories in through the day and don't be afraid to eat. I mean, um, I still, I'm still wary about eating too much of a high fat diet, you know, too many nuts and seeds, but like, don't be afraid to have a few of those things if you really can't keep up with your calories. Don't be afraid to do things like eat some of Chef AJ's oatmeal cookies. That is, um, you know, a grain product that's been baked and dried and more concentrated. So that'd be some of the advice I'd give. And I think with what I know now, I'd also be saying, um, eat, eat, eat those leafy greens and berries and things you know uh generously um you know even eat some with your breakfast because all those foods are full of um antioxidants and anti-inflammatory substances like sure you can put turmeric in your meal but turmeric's not the whole answer and i think that as a 62 year old distance runner i think that all that anti-inflammatory antioxidant stuff makes a really big difference. Like, you know, if my Achilles tendon niggles or, or a little bit of soreness, it usually settles down really quickly. And and I think, and I find that I have a good recovery and, and uh, seldom have a, you know, injury that, that lays me off uh, training. And I think that's, um, the food contributes to that. Absolutely, really good point. But what about people at the other end of the spectrum? So if you're dealing with say, a very petite older lady who just doesn't have that calorie budget and is not doing the amounts of physical activity that an athlete would be doing. Um, radically different recommendations well, or pretty it's similar? it's interesting. It's like sort of whole foods, plant-based. It's sort of like, you know, one diet to rule them all, but with adjustments. Um, so, you know, someone in that demographic might actually have very low muscle mass and a very low resting metabolic rate. And they just don't have the energy, you know, you just, they're not, not going to be able to go for a 10 kilometer run. And, you know, if they start at the gym, it'll have to be, it'll take a long time and for, them, for them to develop any muscle. So I think with that group, um, we'd be keeping the calorie density quite low, but, but not too low. Do you want to elaborate on that journey? You see quite a few people like that. Well, I guess it depends whether when you say petite older lady, whether the whether weight loss is their goal. Um, and uh, I, we do see a, a lot of people who are trying to lose weight. But what I see them do is that they often under eat by way too much. And, um, you know, when we, we say that eating whole food plant based, you don't need to worry about nutrients, you pretty much meet all your nutrient needs. So long as you are meeting your calorie needs. And whenever I see a food diary of someone in that sort of demographic, and they're focused on wanting to lose weight, um, you know, they're not even eating enough calories, you know, for their basal met metabolic rate. Um, and so, you know, the flow on from that over a long period of time is that they're possibly not meeting their nutrient needs in terms of getting enough iron and, and other nutrients. So um, it's encouraging them to eat just a little more, you know, have, instead of a third of a cup of oats for breakfast, try half a cup, try a little more. And when I tell them that I eat a cup of, you know, raw oats before it turns into porridge, um, people are often Amazed. And uh, so it's just encouraging them to eat more of those starchy foods, not to be too scared of them, to be cautious of the calorie dense foods, um, you know, including the sort of baked goods, you know, sometimes there's too much bread in there, but also the, the very the fat rich foods. So that's, that's kind of the advice we're, we're often giving people. Mm. I'm always telling people to close the buffet after the evening meal, go and clean your teeth, because that's often the time of the day when the, the cramp, the Doug Lyle cramp circuits activated and, 
and, and they just start re reaching for the richer food. I think one of the biggest fears that um, we come across, and I, and I get this with a lot of athletes that I coach, um, the whole calorie deficiency, it's the fear of weight gain. And, and it's that understanding that a whole food plant-based diet is low fat. So it's, it's reprogramming the brain that you know volume does not e necessarily in equal weight gain because people are so accustomed to eating a different type of diet that it does mean more volume, more weight gain. So it's it's recomputing that thought that, uh, and that's where the fear of, like you say, Jenny, instead of a third a cup of oats, having a half a cup. I mean, I get messages saying, oh, is, is that too much for me? No, it's not. It's it's that it's that fear of, of weight gain. I think that's where, is that where you'd find is the biggest sort of challenge in terms of getting people to understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of in, in any of the programs we run, um, whether it's a you know a day seminar or if we do a four part webinar series or at, at our immersion event, um, the I do a talk on calorie density, and I consider that absolutely the key to understanding to getting this right, regardless of where they are on on the spectrum. There, you know, if they're athletic and wanting to gain or maintain weight, if they're um, you know, overweight and wanting to lose weight, that calorie density is the key. So we sort of really, um, you know, drive that home pretty hard to people that um, if they get that right, they'll understand. And so, you know, whilst we might ask people to do a bit of calorie, you know, food tracking for a few days, in the end, it's like the only thing you need to be really monitoring is if you reach for the rich food, that that's where you notice the calories. You know, if you're going to reach for that, um, you know, vegan chocolate bar, notice just how much you're eating at the moment that you're about to put it in your mouth. Um, we're not counting calories of, you know, the beans and the grains and all those things, but we, we do be really mindful of, of the richer food, including the whole foods. Like, you know, you're going to eat, um, you know, don't grab a handful of walnuts, you know, crunched one or two on top of a salad. So just to be really mindful when they're, they're having those calorie dense foods. For the benefit of our listeners, what's the issue of consuming too little calories? What's the problem there? Oh, there'd be too, uh, not enough energy. Um, yeah, and... I think um, um, too few calories will mean you get less nutrients. So you might be a little bit low, you might get less fibre as well and, and remain sort of blocked up despite being on high plant foods. I think it can often make people feel tired. Like, like I think there are quite a few few men or very active people who um, go whole foods plant-based and say, oh, I just had low energy. And you sort of, most of the time that's not protein deficiency or anything else. It's from just not eating enough calories. I think also if you underdo the calories too much, even if you're trying to lose weight, then you'll set, set yourself up for a feast and famine. That is at some point the parts of your brain will overrule your willpower if we ever had much of that to start with and just say, just spread that peanut paste on that bread. Another tablespoon, Ben. <laughs> but that, like bringing it back to your oat example, like I work with a lot of patients that are scared to do that, you know, quarter cup extra of oats, but they'll happily put two tablespoons of peanut butter on top to get more protein, right? So yeah, calorie density is so, so important to understand um, and really important to implement that because as you say, like if you're not getting enough calories and then you put a piece of meat back on your plate and you're feeling fantastic from that, oh, it was the, it was the vegan diet, nothing to do with, you know, the fact that you're just not eating enough calories to begin yes, with. That's right. Yeah. So your website, wholefoodplantbasedhealth.com.au, it's a really fantastic resource. I send a lot of uh, my patients your way, actually. Um, and under this umbrella, you offer a number of services. Some you've already mentioned. So your seminars, your webinars, your uh, immersion retreats. Could you tell us a little bit more um, about what you have on offer there and why you created it in the first place? Well, the original website um, was, oh, I, I think the original idea, Malcolm for years had thought he might write a book, um, but the librarian in me is, um, you know, how can I connect people to information? And I'd said to him long ago, oh, you know, that's like, who's going to buy it? Who's going to find it? Once you've written it, it's out of date. 
Um, so, you know, I think it was back in 2012, we started planning the website and I didn't know anything about building websites. So we had this naive idea that we would um, get someone else to build it for us. <laughs> um, but uh, it, along the way, Malcolm decided he also needed a website just for himself as a doctor. So um, we got someone to build the, a little sort of like two page Dr. Malcolm Mackay website. And that's when I realized the enormous cost um, if we got someone to build our, our ever growing draft you know, page, multiple page website. So I taught myself how to build web websites with you know the theme of the day back in 2012. And so it's, you know, it's still got the same old theme. Uh, sometimes people say, oh, you know, it's a bit of an old fashioned website. Well, it is what it is. Um, it's, so it's really a guide. So, you know, it's sort of like a page patient guide. So a lot of the things that Malcolm would be often telling patients, we'd say, well, let's put up a, a page about that. So it just grew from there. It got bigger and bigger, um, you know, with things on different medical conditions and frequently asked questions. In our heads, we've always got about another 100 pages we want to write. <laughs> oh, not only that, but it's, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm um, uh, almost ashamed about all the pages and sections that really need upgrading and updating and improving on, but everyone says they're okay. Yeah, the interesting what Jenny says about patients with medical conditions. Like it was at an immersion event uh, about two years ago where I'd just spoken More about... More than that. Right. pandemic. <laughs> We're not <laughs> counting 2020 as happening. <laughs> that year didn't happen. Yeah. We deleted it. It didn't that. happen. It's been <laughs> skipped on the calendar. Um, and uh, I'd spoken to about four people in a row, you know, in because you know I also provide some medical consultations as part of the living immersion event about you know tweaks they could make to their whole foods plant based diet for a high blood pressure. And then after that, I thought, right, I need to write a page on hypertension. So as Jenny said, it's sort of the, become uh, when I've, I've now when I see a few patients where I, I sort of repeat the same information about the same sort of condition. That leads me to think, okay, I'll, I'll write a little section on that or I'll write a PDF like, you know, people who have difficulty with gut bloating and gas and, you know, um, when they trans, when, when they change to a, a whole foods plant-based diet uh, or start off with those sort of irritable bowel conditions. And so I wrote a PDF, you know, like uh, Restore Your Gut Health that, uh, after I was inspired by um, one of the talks at an international plant-based nutrition healthcare conference. Um, yeah, it needs a lot of work. I'm looking for a wealthy philanthropist to fund me to stay at home and work on it one day a week. But I must admit that during all these lockdowns, some of the days at home and weekends, I've just sort of um, had lockdown lethargy and been less productive than I'd hoped. Yep, um, join the yes, club. <laughs> well, that's the website, Whole Food Plant Based Health. And we're going to continue on to have that as our sort of nutrition information our website and we sort of stick to nutrition you know we try not to diverge out into animal welfare or, or environment because those some of those other areas are important to us but it's like our expertise like you know i'm a healthcare provider so i tend to stick to the healthcare side of it um and of course recently we've launched a brand new website which we did pay someone to make one of those really fancy big scrolly websites that everyone has now um, and in partnership with um, dietitian peter johnston um, we've, we've recently had that website developed and, and, and spent quite a few weeks um, writing content i spent a lot of time sitting there um, as did peter writing content for that uh, and that was to launch um, a 10 week lifestyle medicine program. Um, we were going to start that later this year, but we're now deferring it to next year. But we've done more than just launch that program. We've taken our five night living immersion event at Anglesey, and we've moved that to the Gawler Centre in the Yarra Valley, and we've made it a longer seven day event. And so, while I always did give an afternoon of talks, not just on nutrition, but also on sleep and exercise and mental health and stress in our, at our previous immersions, the longer, and, and you know, we had morning walks and yoga and someone would come in and do some meditation. The longer formatting of this event, another seven nights, 
will allow us to sort of expand out, a bit, expand a bit more on those other domains of healthy lifestyle other than nutrition. Um, and so that will also bring the immersion sort of somewhat in line with the with the 10 week program that we're, we're going to be commencing. So that that also give people a choice. They could do a live in event or they could do originally with all the lock that all the recent lockdowns our plan was to make it a you know weekend event plus a week night weekend in person um one a sunday afternoon in person plus a week night uh webinar but that's sort of on a bit of hold at the moment although we, we are considering we could also launch an online version of that but as i said bringing that new 10-week program whether it's in person or online, who knows what will happen in 2022. Bringing that in line with the uh, immersion sort of potentially gives people a choice. And I, I know it's, um, you know, it sort of broadens the, um, our scope out onto lifestyle rather than just nutrition. But I, I still repeatedly say that of all the domains of healthy lifestyle, uh, uh, nutrition, sleep, physical activity, stress management, mental health, social interaction. I could probably think of more to add to that list. Um, of all those domains uh, of healthy lifestyle, I, still have, I always say that nutrition is a keystone because I think if you get the nutrition right, to start with, some of the other domains tend to fall into place. Like you feel more like physical activity, your mood lifts, you sleep better you're more likely to feel like interacting with other people. So um, our revised immersion event and our 10 week program will still give more emphasis to nutrition than to any other area. And one thing I learned through the life, I hope I'm not rambling on here. One thing I learned from medicine training that I did um, you know, the last few years was the importance of um, you know, the science of behavior change and how to help people to make and sustain and we already incorporate that into um, into our, our immersion events, um, but that's that's something that that we emphasise and talk about quite a bit as well. Because uh, any of those with you know experience training in lifestyle medicine or, or dietetics for that matter will know that it's not just a matter. I mean, if you could just tell people about things, we could just give them a book or a few lists and they could do it. But uh, there's a lot of nuanced sort of work to be done with people to actually help them to uh, um, make changes and sustain them. And, and Jenny sees quite a lot of that because Jenny um, also uh, does uh, group coaching sessions. Yes, I forgot to mention on, on my journey that I, after doing the um, nutrition course, I then um, trained as a, a health and wellness coach. And, and I, I find, you know, that that's, it, that's a really important part of it is understanding how to help people, um, you know, make changes and sustain those changes. And uh, so we've also introduced, um, you know, sort of the option of considerable follow up to any of our events. Um, for the past year, I've been running um, group coaching sessions that I've offered as a package of um, 12 weeks, sort of one hour a week. Um, either you know sort of lunchtime weekday or in the evening and I've now had six groups um, I'm just about winding up my fifth and sixth group um, and uh, and they're all people who have attended either one of our webinar series uh, a seminar you know pre-COVID or um, one of our immersions and so it gives people that option um, you know it might be someone who's been to an immersion a few years ago and they've fallen a little bit off off, off the path and, it, and just to help them get back on and you know my, my goal with them is to encourage them to just shift along the path a little you know further towards a healthy diet and lifestyle and uh, so I've been really enjoying doing that and and it's so we do even the you know the existing the, the immersion prior to our, our revamped one um, you know we did spend a more looking at um, you know behavior change looking at obstacles um, that are going to be in their way because coming back to um, one of your earlier question again about you know how do people you know, how do you encourage people to make change do you encourage them to do it slowly or rapidly I guess one of the differences between if people have the choice of the immersion or a 10-week program 
Um, the, the 10 week program is allowing them to slowly ease in to start to, you know, they've got to cook their own meals. So, you know, they've got to find their way. They've got to learn to go shopping um, and, 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 you know, make healthy meals. So that's, you know, a, a pathway to doing it slowly. Uh, although, of course, we'll be encouraging them part way through that 10 weeks. But how about you really try and go all in now? Um, whereas the immersion is uh, we feed them. So they're, they're stuck. <laughs> <laughs> they're eating, uh, you know, for, for all those days. There. And to be clear, the immersion program is not a vineyard tour in the Yarra Valley. It's, it's, no. That's not part of it. <laughs> no, when we, um, I mean, we're um, holding it at the Great Ocean Road Resort, just around the corner from, um, from Anita Ricky's Digger's Veggie Kitchen. Um, so she, she was doing all the catering. Breakfast, lunch, now. dinner potatoes, air fried potatoes in the afternoon. Uh, and I, I joke with the people there at the start and say, uh, tell them that uh, I monitor the CCTV footage of the <laughs> local food home to make sure they're not going down and buying chips. But we hope that we feed them enough and frequently enough that they won't sort of get the urge to do that. And along with that sort of very high adherence, uh, we, see, we see quite spectacular results that you wouldn't expect in less than a week. Um, like we've had a number of people, um, for example, whose joint pain has settled down, you know, they're osteoarthritic or they're rheumatoid. We've even seen people who have already been vegan and, and fairly healthy and it's just cutting out the last of those oils and, and as Jenny said, adding in more, you know, the leafy greens that are served with breakfast at, at our event um, just makes that difference in one week. Um, and I'm guessing we're all probably a little biased towards nutrition here. As you've already said, Malcolm, you consider it the keystone and I definitely do too as a dietitian, but that's only one pillar of lifestyle medicine. You've already kind of touched on a few of the others, but this 10 week lifestyle program, it looks really comprehensive. So, so well done to you both and to Peter um, for putting it together. It's quite evident that there's a lot of effort that's gone into piecing this all together, but what what else can we expect in it apart from like really focusing in on the nutrition? Well, um, I guess um, the the physical activity. We've we've got someone coming in who uh, does a lot of sort of personal training, coaching of uh, particularly over fifties. In fact, he, he wrote a book. Graham Ellis wrote a book, um, Restored After. Renewed his, his his website's renewed after fifty. Renewed mm -hmm. after fifty. Um, and so we'll, we'll have him actually come in and, uh, you know, talk to the group about that because, I mean, he has a lot of experience. We don't have to so much tell people about the science. I mean, I already, in our current previous format and immersion event, would sort of tell them about, you know, the strength and the aerobic and the balance and the different aspects. Uh, um, but uh, Graham, of course, has a lot of, you know, experience with actually getting people to do it and getting people to do it you know, at an appropriate level in that um, he's quite accustomed to uh, working not with the young athletes but with the people who are a little bit older and maybe maybe are sort of um, starting their fitness journey. So we'll be bringing that in. Um, previously, I, I've just gave, given a very short talk on sleep and I'll pull out my uh, blue-green diodes visor, which always stuns and it looks crazy and my orange glasses where they can't tell whether my undies are blue or grey. <laughs> Still looking for that pair of undies. Um, and, uh, but we'll enlarge on that, that, that as well because that is a very important uh, lifestyle domain. I recently read a book, uh, Why We Sleep, by uh, Matthew Walker. Um, I've taken the listening order to audible books while I'm out on, on two hour plus runs. No, only two hours in Melbourne at the moment. Um, and I guess we have had someone come in at our previous events, you know, and do two yoga sessions and someone come in and do two meditation sessions. But I think at our new event, we'll do a little bit more work on that sort of de-stressing de sort of area. And as a lifestyle medicine domain, you know, they talk about uh, stress or resilience, but it's not often talked about sort of uh, mental wellness. It's, that should have its own domain, you know, separate to stress. And we've got um, Peter's um, um, partner. She's uh, 
she's a, a trauma counsellor and so we'll, we'll get her to sort of do some talking about mental wellness to the group as well. So, so expansion of all of those areas and we're looking forward to walking around the um, uh, the Gawler Centre grounds, Yarra Valley Living, Yarra Centre, Valley Living Centre grounds, which is full of these kangaroos. That last time I was there at a DFN event, you'd run past them and they'd just sort of stand there and look at you. And I sort of imagined I was thinking, no, nah, no, nah, he's not going to catch us. <laughs> that's hopeless. And what teeth? There's no teeth in there. Yeah, that, that, that's a harmless animal. Such a predator. <laughs> Now, can you uh, elaborate a little bit, if uh, within you know the parameters of what you can share, but with all uh, the participants that that you see come through your programs, are there particular trends that you see uh, in terms of you know common trends that? Well, I mean, the, I, I presume the majority of the participants are from Australia, so you know, is it are there trends that are related to? the typical Australian diet or the lifestyle or anything like that? Well, we, we have a really quite a wide range or mix of participants. We've had a couple come from, a few come from New Zealand over the years, just a few. Um, but, you know, we have those, look, sometimes we've had participants who are already eating a whole food plant-based diet, already know a lot um, in this space. They've watched, you know, many Chef AJ interviews and John McDougall and all of those things. Um, and they're just keen to go somewhere where they're going to get fed and they're going to hang out with other people who are, who are interested. So there's sort of that group. But I even, we even hear from, from some of those that, gee, there's a lot they realise they didn't know. And mm. uh, so, you know, that we get good feedback from, from that group. Um, and then there are those who, um, you know, are relatively new to it and a little uncertain as to whether they're doing it right. Um, and maybe they haven't quite met their health goals you know whether it's in terms of um, pain we've had a few people come who have suffered chronic pain and they're just not sure is there anything more they can do so sort of living the experience for those um, sort of six days um, has you know has shown them that there often is a little more they can do um, and then we've had people that know very little about it you know we've we've had um, uh, you know uh, two friends come and one friend knew very little about what she was coming to. <laughs> we had another spouse too like that where she dragged, he dragged his wife along. And you're I'd imagine you get quite a bit of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in this case it was like she was dragged along like, yeah, I'm going to do it because he needs to treat his heart disease or whatever. <clears throat> and at the beginning of the week she told me like, you know, no, I'm not going to stop eating meat, I'm just, but I'm going to support him. Um, by the end of the week, her, um, arth her arthritis her pain arth had gone. Painful <laughs> arthritic knee had stopped hurting. We got an email like a few months later. Look, I'm still eating plant based. I've lost so many kilograms, and my knee still doesn't hurt. Yeah, so the full range, and um, you know, everyone's. And we've even had repeats. You know, people come who've done it before, and they come back because, and they don't even mind sitting through us lecturing to them. Um, yeah, so. There's, it's always good to have a refresher just to reinforce. And I will add that um, talking about the different domains and things, one of the things that I observed quite early on, I should have already known probably, was the uh, uh, power of the group support that, that we, we at our immersion events, you know, we sort of have maybe a dozen people, some, sometimes, uh, you know, a couple more. And this group... The, the group uh, dynamic builds up very quickly and we've started to try and harness that a bit more by like doing little breakout groups during our, our talks and discussions and things. But the group dynamics actually is a very powerful part of the whole event. Absolutely. Um, and, and you're always learning off the people in your group as well. So really helpful for that long-term support as well. Sometimes we need to sort of stand aside and let the group, let the people educate each other during mm. the uh, event. Okay, so for the listeners that are convinced and they want to, you know, get started ASAP, I know COVID has thrown a big spare in, in the works as far as plans go, but What's, what's the next upcoming event that someone could possibly get involved with? In well, the that? next upcoming event, we're, we're going to throw in one of our um, little four-part webinar series um, in early October. And um, I think I've just started listing that on our 
whole food plant-based website um, I'll, I'll, we'll also be any of our events are going to also be listed on the the new melbourne lifestyle medicine website um, as well um, and we've got um, we're we're going to be bold uh, and uh, go for an immersion uh, the third week of, of november so 21st of november and uh, as a demonstration of how um, you know sort of uh, tough we are <laughs> within COVID, we've run three immersions this year already. I don't know how we dodged all the lockdowns in Victoria. One of them, one but, of them, um, um, in February, a lockdown was declared um, and didn't get opened up till five days before our event. We just kept saying to everybody, "Hang in there. There'll mm. be full refunds if it doesn't happen. If we can go, we'll go." And we did. And, and that was February, March. And then after the May event, I think it was a week later, there was we're um, in for lockdown. back in lockdown yeah, again. Yeah. So we're, we're good at lock, we've, dodging we've lockdowns. <laughs> <laughs> so fingers crossed by the third week of November, um, we're able to have an in-person event with, you know, where so long as we can have, say, a group of 20 people in a room, which will include us, um, we'll, be, uh, we'll be good to go. So we'd be a full refund if, uh, if COVID uh, does its tricks again. And uh, we'll be planning to, now that we've found a, a new venue um, and uh, it's our plan to do at least four you know, possibly even five immersions throughout next year. And uh, we'll sort of weave them in and around us doing these 10 week programs as well. Oh, that's brilliant and absolutely beautiful spot too. So highly recommend anyone that is listening, go. It'll be phenomenal. But for those that are impatient and can't wait till the next one, or uh, <laughs> let's be realistic from New Zealand, no one can get there for, for a wee while, uh, any, but, but they're inspired. They're inspired to make some change. Is there a particular tip that you could offer that would allow someone to start their journey? What would be the first piece of advice you would offer our listeners? This is how you should start that journey. Oh, I'm going to start with that depends as to whether they're um, someone that needs recipes. If, if, if we think that they are, one of the, um, the, the most, I, know, I think the most useful books that um, we advise people to get hold of and we actually been you know giving them away at our immersion and we're planning our own in-house uh, version of this with the original author emma roche's whole food plant based on five dollars a day and uh, so we've been working with her to actually have our own little in-house um, for our lifestyle medicine program but so that book has recipes in it emma is australian she's currently living in europe um, and the five dollars is actually targeted targeted uh, to US dollars, but, um, uh, and she's got meal plans, so you, a 28 day meal plan. And I know of people who have sat down with that book and just started and they've gone shopping and they've made the recipes, you know, some they'll like, some they might not like as much, and that has got them going. So for someone who really needs recipes, I think that's a great start. For others, it's more about saying, well, what do you already like that are whole plant foods, you know, do you like potatoes, do you like rice? So just start adding in, have more of these foods and start, you know, cutting back. If you're not prepared to completely take the meat off the plate yet, just cut back the portion size, you know, sort of cut the fish in half, cut it in half again um, and uh, and start adding in, you know, make a dal that might, mightn't be a whole meal for that night, but, you know, have it in the, the fridge or the freezer and have a little bit um, added to your plate. So the focus on adding in is our other big, big piece of advice. So, you know, we, we say at our, at our events, it's like, you know, it's up to you as to whether you want to go all in or whether you want to just um, go gradually. Um, we know from some research that was done um, in the US that um, when people who are whole food plant-based were asked, you know, what's the best way to transition? You know, jump in and nearly everyone says, yeah, jump in quickly. And then they were asked, well, how did you transition? And most people answer, yeah, I did it pretty slowly. Mm. <laughs> and uh, I think Malcolm has also identified that part of that is a bit of a personality thing. If you're an all or nothing person, you're probably going to do better by just yeah. emptying out the fridge, empty out the pantry, go shopping for, you know, the new foods you're going to be eating and you just start. But if you're a little more like me, um, you'll, you'll dabble, you'll, you know, you'll ease into it, you'll start doing it more and more um, until, you know, you find you're, you're doing it fully. 
So I'm not sure that's <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's and, an it depends answer. And I think many uh, many other um, um, whole foods plant based experts actually recommend the approach of spending a week or two of actually working out, you know, trying out a few um, um, options for evening meals, working out what you can eat for breakfast, uh, and then going all in. Uh, and I will say, um, I think to keep it, keep it simple, like, you know, for example, you might listen to Dr. Michael Greger, and we're a great fan of Dr. Michael Greger, but if you try to follow every little bit of you know, perfection advice about how to do plant-based nutrition, you'd just be overwhelmed. So I'd be saying, keep it simple. You know, it, half the plate is starchy food, half is non-starchy vegetables. Um, take a B12 tablet. You know, it, it's really not very complicated. But I'd also be adding in that, um, you know, that, that as Jenny said, it's sort of up to you how whole foods plant-based you are. But if you want to get the full health benefits or you're starting off trying to, you know, get your blood pressure down, you may actually need to have quite a high level of adherence to really get the results you're looking for. Yeah. I guess after a period of time, if you don't quite get those results, there's usually further refinements that you can make further down the track. Yeah. And oftentimes in those kinds of situations, the motivation follows the action because you are getting such improvement so quickly. It's kind of like a positive feedback loop there to continue on. I think Dean Ornish suggests that, mm -hmm. that it's like it reframes the motivation. And I guess that's one of the probably advantages of the live in event is that people often feel so well and get such a good response in that short period of time that it reframes it from treating blood pressure or so I don't get prostate cancer one day to I feel so much better doing this that um, Jenny's mother's like that. It's sort of quite early on. She sort of thought, well, no, I'm not going to be going tempted to eat some oily or animal product meal because the next day my joints will be stiff. It's sort of like I don't need any external motivation because I experience the wellness and, and that truly is motivating. The, the challenge as health practitioners is to get someone far uh, far enough along the journey that they experience that wellness and that can that can be a challenge it would be someone who is trying to do it you know they they're trying but they're just not quite and um, they're not feeling any better and it's how can you convince someone that it really is worth um, taking you know bigger steps into eating this way that's it is a challenge million dollar question but again like that will be why it's so important with your new program to have that group setting so you're getting mm. you know input from all different areas not just the health professional that's telling me i've got to do this and i've got to do that so that's, no, yeah. I, I really look forward to seeing how this goes for you i really hope it goes from strength to strength um you know you've been such trailblazers in the plant-based movement in australia and you've touched so many people's lives so many people have improved their health because of the work that you do. So I look forward to keeping track on how this all goes for you. I hope COVID doesn't throw too many spanners into the works. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming on today and, and sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us and, and good luck for Melbourne Lifestyle Medicine. Thank you so much, Eva. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for listening to the Lentil Intervention Podcast. Make sure you subscribe and share this podcast with your friends and visit the website for more details.